Once she was satisfied, she looked up at the others that watched her. She smiled, blushing at the attention. All right, I'm ready to get going, said Avery, patting the place where the locket rested against her. Great, let's head down and try to get there before night comes. It's a clear shot from the tram station, so it shouldn't be too hard to get to the tavern, said Samuel. Avery and Rose got up from the bed, Rose jumping down to the hardwood floor from the softness laying above, and the four of them made their way to the door. The ladies exited first and waited in the hallway as Barkley and Samuel left the room, closing the door behind them. The travelers went down the stairs where they found Jeffries waiting for them down by the front door landing. Ready to go, asked Jeffries. Sure are, said Barkland, rubbing his stomach gently with one paw once again. It rumbled slightly as he circled his paw. Jeffries smiled at the four of them. That's great. I've let Ro know that you're on the way and he'll be waiting for you. He'll probably be extremely busy, but if you go up to the main bar and sit down, when he gets a chance, he'll make his way over and say hi. It shouldn't take him too long. But if he does take a while, feel free to soak up the tavern. It's a wonderful aesthetic, said Jeffries rather proudly. We'll lose it, Samuel. All right. Best of luck. And remember, have fun, said Jeffries, walking them to the front door and opening it for them. He waved to them as, as they left. Have a wonderful night. The door will be unlocked when you get back, so feel free to come in. Apologies if I don't meet you, as I may fall asleep rather early tonight, as I've got to get up early to prep the house for the children's arrival. We will. Have a nice night, Mr. Jeffrey, said Rose, waving back at the wombat. Jeffrey smiled and closed the door with a click. Rose turned back down towards the street and skipped down the steps towards the sidewalk. The others followed her down as she headed in the direction of the tram station. Slow down, Rose, said Barkland. Rose slowed her steps and looked back at Barkland, who was a few feet away. Sorry about that. I guess I'm excited to get to the tavern. The tram should be fun this time now that I know what to expect, said Rose. Barkland and the others smiled at her. Should be a lot of fun for the four of us, said Samuel. The group hurried down the sidewalk, making quick work of getting to the tram station. They walked to the stairs leading to the platform and headed to the ticket machines lining the side of the platform. Though it was later in the day, there seemed to be no difference in the size and variety of crowds of animals that lined the platform. The anteater that walked between platforms while Rose and Samuel were there earlier in the day had been replaced by a female counterpart that was making the rounds, heading up the stairs to the bridge that joined the opposing platform. She checked her watch as she passed the travelers and hurried on up the stairs. Crowds of animals made their way towards and away from the line of ticket machines, milling back into the crowds that lined the machines and surrounded the waiting area of the loading section of the tram station. A smaller group huddled around the maps adorning the wall next to the machines, studying their routes for the day. Most were too busy to notice the group, other than to diverge and regroup around the path they took towards the machines. A sea of animals moving naturally in chaotic synchronization as they made their way down the platform. They split into two pairs, Barkland with Samuel and Rose with Averly, and waited in line. Hand me one of your coins and I'll get you your ticket for you, said Rose to Averly. Averly reached into her pouch around her neck and pulled out a shiny silver coin and handed it to Rose. Brooklyn did the same to Samuel and as the two lines shortened towards the wall of machines. A pair of otters were before Rose and Averly and upon taking their tickets quickly disappeared into the crowded station platform. The young female fox that stood before Brooklyn and Samuel grabbed her ticket and did much the same, though in the opposite direction. The two pairs reached the machines almost at the exact same time. Rose fed her coins into the metal beast and pulled down the lever from Middletown. Two tickets sped out of the machine into the collection tray at the bottom of it. The same thing happened as Samuel pulled his own lever. Rose and Averly turned to Barkland and Samuel and the four of them made their way to the glass stained panels. They were in the height of the platform near the loading area of the tram. Past them, Averly and Barkland both staring up at the sheer size of the glass work and made their way to the standing crowd of animals waiting for the next tram to come. The four of them gathered to the side of the nearest stained glass pillar. A large collection of reds, blues, yellows, and greens had mixed in the light and steadied themselves against the metal and stone frame of the glass. We should be good here while we wait, said Rose, leaning against the, the glass and facing the others towards the crowds beyond. Rose scanned the crowd, seeing if anything was amiss. What are you looking for? asked Parklin. We saw some of Averly's old family members the last time we were on the tram, said Rose, one paw resting against her forehead. I'm just making sure I don't see any animals in red bandanas. Oh, that makes sense, replied Barkland. Yes, don't worry about it too much. It's not like we're going to see them again. The city is huge, said Rose, but I thought it would be good just to double check to make sure. Averly nodded. Thanks for checking. I'm sure we're fine, but it's nice to know you're thinking of my safety while we're out here, said Averly. Averly came and stood next to Rose, resting against the redstone pillar just below the edge of the glasswork, reaching to the ceiling, and scanned the crowds with her, while using Barkland and Samuel to block her from most of the view of the uninterested crowds around them. 
A family of raccoons passed by them, the mother leading the three small children, each holding the leading raccoon's paw with their own, and the father held the paw of the youngest raccoon as they dipped and weaved through the crowd. Satisfied they were quite safe, Averly relaxed against the wall and let out a small sigh. <sighs> Seems like we're alright, said Averly, letting out another breath. <sighs> as long as you're comfortable, said Samuel. I'm fine. It's nice to be outside, and the station is so very pretty, said Averly, looking at the stained glass that spanned out of the length of the bridge between the two platforms. Samuel turned and followed where Avery's eyes had swept. You're right. The work that went into this place is exquisite, said Samuel. Jibber's lantern glowed and the door squeaked open slightly. One large dark eye stared out from the lantern the glass reflected in the fiery pupil. It is lovely, said Chibri. Samuel bent and gathered the lantern to his side, cupping it between both paws. How are you, Chibri? Are you alright? asked Samuel. Sorry, I haven't been able to let you out, but we've had to come out again so quickly that I didn't get a chance to let you out to relax a bit. Chibri scoffed. It's all right, Sammy. I've been listening to what you've all talking about, and it's not hard spending time in here. I've spent weeks pent up, so a few hours aren't much of anything other than a chance to rest and dream, said Chibri. Samuel was relieved. He still wasn't used to carrying someone else on his side and had unfortunately forgotten Chibri was there. The lantern was extremely light and made almost no sound as it moved with his body, not that he would let the little flame elemental know that, of course. I'll keep an eye out for you, for those animals. I got a look at them through the window the last time we saw them. Shouldn't be too hard to let you know if they're around. It'll keep me busy in any case, said Chibri. That would be lovely, said Rose, speaking into the lantern that hung near her head. No problem, folks. You go about your day and enjoy yourselves, and I'll, and I'll let you know if I see anything out of the ordinary, said Chibri. Thanks, Chibri, said Samuel, allowing the lantern to a side once again. No problem came from the lantern as the door swung shut with a mild click. It's nice to have multiple sets of eyes looking out for me, said Averly, smiling at the lantern. The large pair of eyes that stared from between the curtains within the lantern wrinkled as though they braced a smile, and then Chibri winked up at Averly before turning her gaze beyond the group itself, focusing on the multitude of animals that moved around them. The female anteater that had hurried up the stairs over the bridge was coming back down the stairs in the opposite direction, having pleaded her round on the opposite platform, pocket watch and paw, and was shouting out her information between the animals she passed, and town tram arriving shortly. Have your tickets ready. And town tram arriving shortly. Please clear the loading areas for the arriving passengers. Belted out the young anteater, her hat tilting back on her head as she spoke. The anteater passed by the group, repeating herself and headed down towards the end of the platform. Animals that had been standing in the yellow line section of the waiting area, the section that allowed the arriving animals to disembark, hurried to the side as best they could, creating a clear pathway out into the platform at two sections of the waiting area. That's our tram, said Rose excitedly. Great, said Parkland, who loved riding in mechanical carriages whenever he had the chance, was looking forward to getting a ride in a tram. The travelers made their way to the nearest group of waiting animals on the left-hand side of the yellow line section, designated by a mute white rectangle that rang down the platform until it met the next yellow lined rectangle farther down the platform. They huddled together and, w and waited for the tram to pull up. A burning sigh built up as the tram pulled into the station and stopped cleanly along the white rectangles of the platform, both sets of the doors lining up with each of the yellow lined rectangles perfectly before it came to a hissing stop. The doors sighed as they opened and the arriving animals spilled out in a northerly fashion into the platform, many making their way to the stairs and dispersing into the streets beyond the station. Once those animals stopped appearing between the doors of the tram, the groups waiting meshed and began filling the tram up to capacity. The seats were all taken by the time the four of them made their way into the compartment, and they centered themselves around the pole nearest the door, each of them grabbing a paw rest nailed into the pole up its length and around its circumference. A small mouse raced onto the tram as the doors began closing, almost catching its tail in, in the door as they closed completely, only avoiding it by grabbing its tail with one paw and wrapping it around himself as the doors slid closed behind him. The mouse sighed. <sighs> and leaned against the door, unable to find his way to a pole. A series of rails had been built into the door, and he held himself there as the tram hissed into the life once again, and began moving in the same direction it had traveled as it arrived. The animal swayed as one as the tram picked up speed, and then again as it rounded the first corner, leaving the station behind it. Light cascaded through the stained glass windows, lining the clear viewing windows down the length of the compartment. The sun was beginning its travel to set and had a warm quality to it, which Rose found comforting as they swayed gently with the motion of the tram. How long is the ride until the middle town station? asked Parkland, holding the loop resting up above his head, dipping as the tram sped up. Not too long, about twenty minutes or so, said Samuel. Rose nodded. Yes, it's not too long at all. Though it could be more comfortable getting to sit than having to stand, I would wager, said Rose, staring at the crowded seats lining the tram's compartment. 
Samuel nodded as the tram slowed to take another corner, knocking him into the pole with his shoulder as he grasped the loop nearest him. I would have to agree with you, said Samuel, smiling, as the tram sped up again, forcing him away from the pole. I'm looking forward to this, said Avery. Taverns are always a lot of fun, and many of them have some amazing food. Parkland's stomach grumbled. Rose and Samuel laughed as it gurgled in hungry protest. Bit hungry, are we, Barky? said Rose, smiling up with a badger. Sure I am. I should have took some sandwiches with me up to the library when I had the chance, said Barkland, doing his best to quiet his distressed stomach. Averly relaxed into the motion of the tram, holding onto her strap near her stir, bracing herself against the tram's movement with her foot resting against the pole. It had been a while since she had been on a tram or in a city this size for that matter, and she was enjoying the feeling of freedom that she felt being with her friends in the middle of a town she had never been to before. It didn't matter that Valderon was near her, she could feel a new sense of herself. It had changed when she felt that Lockett connect with her, that she finally had a way to defend herself that she wasn't aware she had available before. It was invigorating. Averly smiled to herself in spite of the threat that Valderon and the others meant. She was just going to enjoy herself as best she could and worry about it if it happened, considering nothing might happen at all if she was lucky enough. Samuel noticed that Averly was staring off into space. You were right there, Averly? asked Samuel, concerned, masking his face. Averly turned to him, blinked twice, and smiled a wider grin. I'm doing great. This is going to be a fun night, said Averly, unable to hide her enthusiasm. They stood swaying with the motion of the tram as the ticket taking Anteater came through the compartment and clicked their tickets. Averly had out the ticket up to the stained glass, lining up the ant cutout over the multiple pieces of glass, forcing a mosaic of color to blend through the dull cream ticket. Averly moved her paw, causing the ant to cascade colors as it moved between panes and smiled to herself as she played with the ticket. Did you notice the ticket punches a little ant, said Averly? Rose and Samuel nodded. We did. We were making our ants walk when we got our first ticket's punch, said Samuel, smiling. Parkland reached into his pocket for a ticket, having stuffed it unceremoniously back into his pocket without looking at it after handing it to the ticket taker. He stared at the ant and bent the ticket back and forth between his fingers, making the ant walk in place as he flexed the paper. That's cute, said Parkland, flexing the ticket again and again. Yeah, I wonder if it's a joke the anteaters have between themselves or if it's just that particular anteater sense of humor, said Rose, playing with her own ticket. No idea, but it's pretty neat, said Barklam, before growing bored with the game and stuffing the ticket back in his satchel around his neck with one ball. The tram slowed and came to their f first stop. Animals made their way out of the compartment, and before the next group of passengers got on, the four of them made their way over to the center aisle of chairs where a selection of them had become vacant and sat down, facing one another. Barkland and Rose on one side, Samuel and Averly on the other. We're almost at our stop. It should be the next one, said Rose. The tram filled with... Those animals looking to make their way down into the center of town and beyond in the spot that they had been standing in had been filled in by a set of three anteaters. The one facing directly towards Rose and Barkland wore rose-colored spectacles, and they all had matching blue and green jackets. They held onto the pole between them as the tram hissed and jerked into motion and came out of the station heading towards the next stop and the tavern's destination. The four of them sat quietly, waiting as the tram made its way down the gleaming metal tracks between the oblong and squat buildings on either side of the rails, following its predetermined path with practiced and routinely measured speed and grace. Midway between the stops, the ticket-taking anteater came through once more, asking for tickets from the new passengers announcing the stop that the group wanted to hear. Middletown next, please be ready to disembark. Before the tram comes to a stop, Middletown next said the anteater passing through the compartment once more and heading back into the other side of the tram where the rest of the passengers waited to hear the same message. Best get up now and wait for the door, said Barkland, standing from his seat. The others did the same and they walked as close to the door that the other passengers would allow, coming to stand near the group of anteaters. They waited as the tram pulled into the station, slowing methodically, hissing a great breath and came to a stop into the station. The anteaters held onto the pole for dear life as the animals, including Rose and the others, pushed past them and around them and made their way out into the station nearly identical to the others they had been in prior. The group walked out onto the platform and scanned the area, looking for the exits as the animals they were waiting their turn loaded into the tram behind them. Unlike the other stations, which only had one exit and entrance from which passengers could travel to the opposing platforms via an overhanging bridge, the station was mirrored in that it had one on each end with a third spiral staircase in the center of the floor that offered one more way a travel for those needing to go in the other direction in which they had arrived. Parkland's eyes followed the bridge over to the other platform where the signs to the streets rested over an arched tunnel and pointed towards it. That's where we need to go, said Parkland. The others followed his finger and agreed. 
They made their way over to the staircase, a stone and metal spiral inlaid with cast blocks of stained glass that ran within each step. The late afternoon light from the open trackway mirrored the blue sky within the cubes. As they made their way up the steps, their footfalls lost in the din of the station's cacophony and walked over the breezeway to the other side and made their way down again, holding the rail as they twirled towards the floor once again. They passed through the crowds that amassed around the ticket machines, maps, and the seated and standing waiting areas and those animals between those points and headed towards the tunnel and the exit beyond. The tunnel was lined with clear glass blocks under which large stained glass blocks rested which threw panes of light against the tunnel's curved walls, lighting the airy passage. A breeze from the street carried into the passage, which they felt push against them as they came closer to the street and became warmer as they reached the small flight of stairs that led up to the sidewalk. They stepped up quickly and out from the metal and some co- and stone covering and into the s- sun and into the sunlight overhanging the street beyond. The group looked around, taking their bearings, noting the heavy traffic that passed in both directions down the whole street they stood on and that which turned to and from the street they would need to cross and head down towards samuel took a deep breath through his nose relishing the smells of the city and smiled he turned and looked at the others well let's get going then said samuel making his way through the animals that passed through the sidewalk and and standing underneath the glass light signal that alerted pedestrians that it was safe to pass through the street the others quickly caught up with him. A bit excited, are we? asked Sparklin, smiling at Samuel. Samuel smiled sheepishly. Well, yes, I suppose so, said Samuel. Rose looked up at Samuel and smiled, squeezing his leg gently with her paw. Avery took note of the movement and smiled quietly to herself. Hi, everybody. So I've made a new store called AnimalQuest.shop, and I made my first shirt. Sparkling reading at the Amberstone's house, and I would ask that you go and buy those there. I'll make a few bucks each time you buy something from there. And I have men, women's, baby clothing, and buttons, as well as other accessories, including dog bandanas, which I think are pretty cool. And I'll be adding more merch every week or two for that store as the stories progress and the sequels are written and read. I'll do the same for Divergent Mind. The link again is animalquest.shop. The link for Divergent Mind will be divergentmind.shop as well. Thank you so much. Jay. Please visit anchor.fm slash divergent mind to leave a message so that I may get back to you. Thank you. Have a nice day. So Anchor is asking me to ask you to support me financially. I would ask that you go to my Patreon to do that, which is patreon.com slash divergent mind. It means you can either become a monthly subscriber at a different tier of one to three to five dollars. I'm not looking for a lot. I'm not asking for a lot. I'm not asking for anything. This is going to go to the end of my podcast. I don't like it when podcasts straight up ask you for money. When I'm doing okay. Well, I'm not doing okay. I'm surviving now to the point that I can make this. I would love to be able to make improvements to this by, say, getting... So basically, I'm running off an iPad, and I would like to improve it by getting uh, different things that would make it better. Maybe some some headphones that monitor output, or a better mic, though the mic I got was from JWife, so I might not even use the better mic. You know what I mean? It's all about... It's all about whatever I need at the time, but really it's just to get healthy again because I'm currently over 300 pounds and I don't want to die that young. I would really like to be able to afford some vegetables so I can go back to my vegetarian diet because being this big sucks and I'm happy to sit in a chair all day, but I really got to walk my butt off literally. So that's what the money would be for. It would be for healthy food. Because I can't afford it. I can afford ramen and pasta and rice and beans, but I can't live on carbs. Because that's how you get this big on antipsychotics. 
junk food and carbs, which is just cheap and plentiful around me. So I would like to leave my house and just lose some weight. And to do that, I would like to go to the store and buy some vegetables, please. But you don't have to do anything. I'm not asking you to. I'm not begging. I'll figure it out on my own. Much pleasure, Jay. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know that I have a YouTube channel called Taught Myself and that I've decided to start selling merch already with a phrase that my brother showed me saying my disability is invisible of which I made a hat for myself so I decided to make hats, shirts, hoodies uh, for both men and women on Spreadshirt.com all you have to do is search for my disability is invisible it's in green and that's mine. You'll know it's me because when you click the sale icon, the same little Divergent Mind icon comes up. And I hope you support me. I make about $5 per shirt or per sale. Everything else goes to Spreadshirt. But that's okay because it's still a better deal than a lot of other places. And I really hope you'll support me. Come check me out on the YouTube. Teach me how to do that properly so I can have a community there too. And I await your response. Have a lovely day. Jay. Hey, people. Take a listen to the Divergent Mind podcast. You get both insight into living with a, mental, a serious mental illness and get to listen to a lovely tale about a journey cute little animals need to take. Don't miss out. And remember, divergent minds don't need to think alike. Please go to ratethispodcast.com slash divergentmind and tell me what you think. 
Thank you very much. Yours truly, Jay. <laughs>